The city of Rome is alive with cheery crowds and no one is at work. It's one big street party to celebrate Julius Caesar's latest military victory over the sons of General Pompey the Great, his arch enemy. Two Roman tribunes, a fancy name for elected officials, are seriously angry with the way the citizens are behaving. Morales lays some major guilt trips, reminding the crowd of their hypocrisy. They used to support Pompey, an honourable man, and cheer for him. The tribunes warn the people they should be terrified of what evil Caesar will unleash now he's sole ruler of Rome. The citizens trudge back to their homes, a lot more subdued. But nobody is feeling down for long because it's the festival of Lupercalia, a festival of purification that also promoted fertility and safe childbirth. Trumpet sound. Caesar enters triumphantly. Followed by his wife, Calpurnia, and close friends. We meet Mark Antony, one of Caesar's top generals, along with Brutus, one of Caesar's best friends. Then a mad-looking soothsayer approaches Caesar, saying repeatedly, Beware the Ides of March. The Ides of March was a deadline for settling debts but seems to have no real significance to Caesar. He decides this guy is a few sheets short of a toga party, in other words, crazy, and ignores the warning. Now remember, at this time, Rome is a republic, which means that it is free from the potential tyranny of a royal ruler. After the others leave, Brutus and Cassius hang back. Brutus says he's very conflicted right now. He's worried that Caesar wants to be crowned king. Cassius is secretly excited to hear this. He is jealous and wants Caesar overthrown. Cassius starts buttering him up. He tells Brutus he has so many great qualities. He also reminds Brutus that it was his distant relative who killed the tyrant Tarquin years ago and founded the Roman Republic. So supporting the freedom of a republic runs in his genes. Brutus isn't sure. After all, Caesar's his friend. But he leaves the door open, saying he wouldn't want to be a son of Rome if it was ruled by a king. Hmm. Cassius is encouraged by this. Caesar returns. He guesses something's up with Cassius. Antony tells Caesar there's nothing to worry about, but Caesar has a whole list of things he doesn't trust about Cassius. Meanwhile, Casca tells Brutus and Cassius that Caesar was offered a crown three times by Mark Antony, and each time he refused. The crowd loved it. But, says Casca, the crowd didn't realise how much Caesar really wanted the crown. Cassius suggests Casca come eat dinner with him the next night. He's planning a conspiracy. Cassius comes up with the perfect plan to get Brutus on his side. He'll forge a whole bunch of letters from concerned citizens. He's pretty sure this will swing Brutus over. Later on that night, a huge thunderstorm descends on Rome and there's wildness in the air. Cassius hasn't been able to sleep. He's seen some really bizarre things and had crazy dreams. Meanwhile, outside on the street, Casca and Cicero are talking about the storm. When Cicero leaves, Cassius comes up. Casca tells Cassius, that his fever dreams are not random nightmares. They're about Caesar. Casca adds the shocking news that the Senate will make Caesar king tomorrow morning. This enrages Cassius, and he and Casca vow that they'll never let Caesar take over Rome as a dictator. They bump knuckles to make it serious. Cinna 
a very slippery politician, arrives. He and Cassius decide they will throw the forged handwritten notes into Brutus's bedroom window. Cassius gives a thumbs up. He's pretty sure Brutus will switch sides tomorrow. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on Julius Caesar, check out our summary of Act 2.